Welcome back everyone. Welcome back to the Rat Shack. I'm Rat. Today we are going to continue the HVACR vacuum series. Episode 4, 5, not sure which. But today we get into the meat and potatoes of the vacuum. What it is, how we reference it, what we use to create it, what we can do to make it faster. Um, ultimately how to test whether or not your vacuum is good whether you've dehydrated and degassed the system adequately or if you have a leak and just some more details uh, this is going to be pretty lengthy I'm going to try to keep the videos to 30 minutes each and try to do it in, in uh, four videos <coughs> don't know how successful I'm going to be at that but as you can see we're in the rat cave got the board got the uh, table set up back here we're going to do some demonstrations as well as pumping speeds. We're gonna show different configura configurations, how I do it, uh, how I recommend it, and uh, you know, also some, some ways that are not how I do it, but maybe just good for uh, someone else. The, uh, the purpose of this started um, two years ago, well over two years ago now. I met Dave Boyd with Appion and uh, Tim from Thermal Engineering, both very knowledgeable about vacuum and what it means to the service tech. And got a book from them called Review of Vacuum for Service Engineers. A little book. See it right there. Review of Vacuum for Service Engineers by Saunders and, and Williams. This book was published in 1957, the first time. Uh, lots of good information in here and everything that you're going to see today uh, or on this video series is going to be based on this book plus there's going to be some other stuff that we've had some discussions on here lately about um, when we triple evac, why we triple evac, uh, purge gases and things like that. We're going to uh, we're going to take care of some of the misinformation that's out there and get back down to the science of why we do what we do and why it's better to do it uh, a certain way over another. Uh, so like I said, Review of Vacuum for Service Engineers, Saunders and Williams, available at Thermal Engineering Company on the website. It's um, thermalengineeringcompany.com. Some people said they were also available on eBay. Don't know if that's true or not. And uh, sometime in the near future, if I get the time, I will convert this to a PDF and uh, try and make it available uh, as an ebook. Uh, of course, pending uh, my talking with Tim because I believe they are the guys that are currently licensed for it. So, here we go. Dave Boyd with Appion, his mantra, if you will, for vacuum is clean, dry, and tight. And to that end, Appion has created the Tez 8, which is a very nice vacuum pump, as well as a hose and manifold system that is called the Megaflow. And we're going to go into all that, but uh, why I'm saying all this is when Dave talks to people about clean, dry, and tight, he's talking about our refrigerant circuits, our line sets, uh, the coils, the condensers, you know, everything like that. And what that means to us and to our customers ultimately is a clean, dry, and tight system gives better performance, longer life, fewer breakdowns, less, you know, maintenance-related headaches. Um, it, it, it's just paramount that we understand that when we, at the end of the day, when we put our refrigerant into a system, we're putting our refrigerant into a system that is as free from contaminants as is humanly possible. And, and what contaminants are left, because nothing's ever 100%, are gonna be caught by system uh, specialties like liquid line filter dryers and things like that. Uh, so clean, dry, and tight is the mantra. That's, you know, that's what we all need to live by and the purpose of this series is to bring that to the forefront. Again, Dave Boyd, Appion, lots of good stuff on their website. We're going to review some of the products here later. Uh, JB Industries, Just Better, people are familiar with them. 
They build good rotary vane vacuum pumps. They have a lot of resources on uh, on the web as well, <coughs> as far as PDFs and deep vacuum and things like that. They also have a very good line of deep vacuum products that are suitable for what we do in some cases and not so suitable in other cases, as we'll talk about. If you've seen the other video series uh, that I shot two years ago with the 6 CFM pump versus the TES 8 and, and all that, those are going to go away, but I will reference them. And, and so if you haven't watched them, watch them first. I'm going to leave them up for a couple of weeks and then I'm going to get them off of there. And, and the reason I'm going to is because when I shot that video, it, some things were done wrong. And I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but when we get to that part, I'll, I'll let you know what it is and you can see the difference because that's, that'll be the point, counterpoint that I make there. Um, very important, it's just, uh, you know, very important stuff. And uh, finally, the last thing on the opening segment is I'm not a scientist. I'm not a uh, physicist. I'm not an engineer. I'm an HVAC technician. Uh, HVAC engineer, service engineer, service technician. Actually, I'm really a service manager, but this is what I like to do. The information, such as what I gleaned from the review of vacuum for service engineers, written by engineers, when we talk about purge gases later on, um, that also came from engineers. But uh, the demonstrations and the experiments and the pumping speeds and and the math and all that stuff that you're going to see is not new. Um, I didn't come up with it. Frankly, I don't have the brain capacity for that. It comes out of here. It comes off of uh, the website from Joey and from a friend of mine, Mac, who is a bona fide physicist and chemist. Um, so, you know, don't comment, call, email that, you know, my demonstrations are unscientific and and my uh, uh, my testing is unscientific. You know, for HVR, HVACR techs, you know what it means to be in the real world, and you know you know what it means to run two machines side by side on the same thing, and evaluate which one does better. No controls, no testability, uh, you know, parameters, no variables or nothing like that. You know, we're talking plain English for the most part. There's some math involved, um, but what we're trying to do is get down where the rubber meets the road and what that means is understanding vacuum understanding the principles of vacuum how we do it how to do it better so that we have a better system and uh, to that end this is not a, a physics class or, or an engineering class it's to help service techs and whoever else wants to understand vacuum better because the principles apply across the board it's just that when I say a good deep vacuum I mean four or five hundred microns not one or two microns and I don't want somebody in the electronic industry sending me an email saying you know 500 microns is not a good deep vacuum you're right it's not for you but for me it is and we'll cover that as well so uh, that's the intent that's the intent of the videos is to is to boil it all down for for service engineers and uh, that's what we're going to do so the first thing we're going to talk about is what is a vacuum and how do we reference a vacuum? What does it mean when we say something is in a vacuum? We're going to go over how to create a vacuum, uh, what the pump actually does to create that vacuum, and that's where we're going to start. So I'm going to uh, change the board around and we'll be right back. All right, so the first question, what is a vacuum? How do we determine if something is a vacuum? Well, there's two reference points for that. One is atmosphere, and one is absolute pressure. So atmosphere exerts pressure all around us. We know that, and but we don't feel it necessarily because we live in it, we're used to it, our bodies are adapted to it, but it exerts, you know, back in the day when people were, were all figuring this out, you know, we used a column of mercury because it's a liquid and it's heavy and they put it in a U-tube and they stuck it, or in a straight tube and stuck it down in a bowl and let it go and, and they figured this stuff out. So what atmospheric pressure means and, and how we reference it is to a column of mercury. 
So 29.921 inches of mercury at sea level, and the mercury is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you also hear 30 inches referenced, and that is because we, you know, 29.921 is a pain to say and write and do all that, so we came up with a way to make it an even 30 inches, and what we did is we took that same column of mercury, same weight, and we heat it up to 58.4 degrees. So at 58.4 degrees, it expands. The weight doesn't change, but it expands to an even 30 inches. And that's how we came up with that. So to convert that to uh, metric, 30 inches is 760 millimeters. Millimeters to microns, because a micron is one one thousandth of a millimeter, 760,000 microns uh, of mercury. And there's 25,400 microns in an inch. So we'll get into detail a little later on why we use microns, but this is a brief explanation of why we use linear measurements. Because we measure the pressure with a linear measurement of mercury inside of a tube and then we converted that over to millimeters which you'll see most of the time and we use microns in vacuum because uh, the millimeter is much more easily divisible than the inch is. You can see that we would have to divide an inch into 25,400 segments uh, to be as accurate as, as the microns are. So the, the second reference pressure is absolute pressure, or zero pressure, zero PSIA. 14.7 uh, PSIA is what we say uh, for atmospheric pressure. So it's 14.7 PSIA above absolute zero pressure. And, and that's the pressure that the atmosphere exerts on us. And when we zero our gauges, we're actually zeroing them to 14.7 PSIA, not actually calibrating them to anything. It's just a reference pressure, that's all. And so in our pressure, uh, on the pressure side of the house, when we say PSI, you know, it's 70 PSI. What we mean is PSIG, or pounds per square inch gauge, not PSIA, which is pounds per square inch atmosphere, or we'd have to add the 14.7 uh, PSIA to that to come up with it. So absolute pressure is zero PSIA or a perfect vacuum. The absolute temperature everybody's heard of, so uh, you know, zero degrees Rankin, is the point at which all molecular activity ceases. It's a theoretical point, we haven't been able to achieve it. Absolute pressure is slave to that because if all molecular activity has ceased in a gas or a vapor, then there's no pressure being exerted. If the molecules aren't moving, there's no pressure being exerted. So zero, zero degrees Rankin, absolute zero temperature, and zero uh, PSIA, or absolute pressure, perfect vacuum, hit at the same point for whatever gas it is. So that's where we come. So a vacuum is any pressure that is less than atmospheric pressure. So we always reference atmospheric pressure. So if I'm pulling a vacuum, I say I have one inch of vacuum reference a 30 inch barometer. And I do that so that I know when I, when I make a, a report that if I want to duplicate that in the field or expand on it, you know, interpolate or extrapolate the data, then I know what my reference is. Because a one inch vacuum at 30 inches of barometer is much different than a one inch vacuum at 28 inches of barometer. Uh, one is a much deeper vacuum than the other. So for our purposes, when we write down a 500 micron vacuum, what we mean is in reference to atmospheric pressure. Uh, we don't write it, but it's still there. And what we're saying is 
literally in reference to the atmospheric pressure at that time we have a 500 micron vacuum uh, and that's how it is I mean we don't write it we don't say it but that's what it is so any pressure above absolute pre uh, absolute zero pressure but below atmospheric pressure is a vacuum so we have to create a vacuum inside a pressurized vessel. The Earth, our atmosphere, is pressurized. So what we're trying to do is take, remove that atmospheric pressure from a vessel, our lines, heads, coils, condensers, all that. And, and, but we're having to do it inside of a pressurized vessel. So we have to look at pressure drops and what that means. And that is where the pumps and the oil type that we use come in because you can never get lower than whatever the pressure difference is. I mean, it's just not possible. So, 14.7 PSIA is how much force the atmosphere exerts on everything that it surrounds. So my whole body, everything out here has, has 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute uh, acting on it. So the question then becomes from from a practical standpoint, uh, the question we're going to ask and hopefully answer is if I have a 100 gallon tank and I remove from that tank 10 gallons per minute, minus 10 gallons per minute of water. Let's say I have 100 gallons of water in a tank and I put a pump on it that's going to remove that water at 10 gallons a minute. In 10 minutes, no more water. Right? So the pump at 10 gallons a minute times 10 minutes pumps out 100 gallons of water. So if I have a 100 cubic foot tank and I hook a vacuum pump up to it that exhausts at 10 cubic feet per minute or CFM so I have a 100 cubic foot tank that's full of gas and I hook a vacuum pump up to it that pumps 10 cubic feet a minute why is it that in 10 minutes, I still have 100 cubic feet of gas. And it doesn't matter if it's 10 minutes or 100 years, it's still going to be 100 cubic feet of gas. The answer is homogeneous dispersal. So one of the things that when I train people on this is that's hard to um, demonstrate is that even if there's two molecules left in there which there's far more than that but even if there are only two they seek a state of equilibrium within that vessel that's 100 cubic feet and so you still have a 100 cubic feet of gas and why that is so is because molecules first of all nature abhors a vacuum and nature abhors imbalances especially in gases so what happens is as as the vacuum pump removes those molecules uh, from the tank the remaining molecules just spread out to fill up the vacant space so that if you start out with you know a billion particles which is actually a pretty small vessel and and you know, you vacuum out all but 2% of them, that 2% is still going to expand to fill uh, the, the vessel. Of course, it'll weigh less, but nonetheless, it's still full. Uh, so homogeneous dispersal, you know, the molecules have, have uh, you know, inherent molecular energy. So as long as that energy is there, and if it's above absolute zero temperature, then it has to be there. Uh, by definition they're moving around and they're bouncing around and 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 
based on environmental conditions, they're going someplace or they're not going someplace. You know, if it's a lower pressure area, they're going over there. If it's cooler, they're going over there. But, you know, it, really all else being equal, they're bouncing around in there off of each other uh, through the open space up against the sides of the vessels and, and they're just bouncing around in there. So homogeneous dispersal uh, is the same as, you know, because of the uh, uh, inherent molecular activity uh, energy, they're trying to reach equilibrium and that's what it's all about. So that's the reason why you know, you can exhaust a 100 cubic foot tank at 10 cubic feet per minute for 100 years and you're still going to have a tank full of whatever gas it is, then it's going to be 100 cubic feet. Uh, and that's important to remember for a couple of reasons, and we'll talk about it later. The bump, when you first turn off the vacuum pump, is as a result of homogeneous dispersal. And, and it, you know, everything that goes along with that. Now, we're talking about a vapor here, you know, liquids largely don't work that way, solids of course don't work that way as either, um, but we're talking about uh, uh, gases, gases and vapors, both. Um, so the difference between a gas and a vapor, and this comes from, from a ways back, a vapor is something that condenses easily, like water vapor, moisture in the air condenses easily, nitrogen, helium, those things that don't condense easily are generally, generally referred to as gases, and, and the difference it really on the pressure side is vapors and gases react differently at, at you know, different pressures whereas both vapors and gases once you start into a vacuum and especially once the vacuum gets low enough they actually start to act you know the vapors start to act more like the um, gases so uh, not important for us really but that's the difference between a vapor and a gas by you know definition and it comes from a long time ago. You know, now we can, uh, you know, we can condense just about any gas out there. I mean, I guess we can't condense any gas out there. But when they started playing with this stuff, uh, they couldn't. You know, nitrogen and helium and those things they couldn't get uh, to condense. They named them gases, and the things they could get to condense very easily, um, they named them vapors. And that's why we have it. So, the tank question, you know. Is, is it's easily answered that way I can give you a good answer but I never had a way to demonstrate it so for this video series I was really trying to come up with a way to demonstrate it and I think I have and so I'm gonna turn the video off and get everything ready and, and we're gonna do the tank demonstrate okay so to demonstrate homogeneous dispersal here we have our uh, 100 cubic foot tank and this glass here has water in it and this glass has water now the water is the actual tank okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some food coloring in one and then put some food coloring in the other to demonstrate how the molecules disperse evenly and, and even though it's not a vacuum it does demonstrate uh, molecular dispersal so in the first glass we're going to put 10 drops of food coloring one two three four five six seven eight nine ten And of course, we've all done this as kids, and we, and you know, we marvel at how a single drop of ink or food coloring or something like this can can color an entire uh, glass of water. Uh, now, uh, this glass of water obviously represents our tank with 10 drops in it, which is the tank uh, starting out with 100 cubic feet of gas in it um, before we. You know, took uh, exhausted. I'm gonna go ahead and stir it up to help the dispersal along. I'm going to excite those molecules a little bit. Eventually, it would have reached this state. We're just gonna help it. So, here's the same vessel after we've exhausted. Uh, you know, let's say 90% of the gas out of it. Whoops. So, you can see that all I did was put a single drop in. I'm going to go ahead and help this one stir up as well. So you can see you know, the, the difference in the color, obviously, between the two. So if you can see the molecules inside our, our vessel, when, when we had the high pressure inside the vessel, or even atmospheric pressure, if you could see the energy inside there, the molecular energy, it would have looked like this. And then once we had exhausted it to, uh, 
you know, exhausted 90% of the molecules out of there, the energy would look like this. And, and yes, there's less and they're fewer, but you can see that the, the molecules are dispersed throughout the entire vessel, through all of the water, evenly. And, and that the water is colored evenly top to bottom, just the same as it is here, it's evenly co colored top to bottom, even though it's darker here than it is here. Um, the molecules have filled out, have spread out, they've reached equilibrium based on environmental conditions and their, their inherent molecular activity or energy. So that's why uh, pulling a vacuum is different than getting water or any liquid out of a vessel. The, the molecules always fill. You know, water isn't going to expand to fill the, the vessel uh, as long as we're pumping it out. It's just one of the characteristics of water. But gases and vapors don't work that way. So that's a demonstration on why that if you exhaust a vessel, doesn't matter how long it is, how long you do the uh, vacuum, there's always going to be uh, gas left in it. There's no such thing as a perfect vacuum. We can't create it. So what we need to start thinking about is in terms of molecular activity, homogeneous dispersal. When we really start thinking about vacuums, let's start thinking about that. Uh, the next video is going to be on that specifically. Uh, well, we're going to start out there anyway and, and get on down the road, but, but uh, what we're talking about here is getting molecules out of there, not reducing the pressure. We don't reduce the pressure. We get rid of the molecules and that reduces the pressure. So, you know, in, in, you know to say, yeah, you know, I reduced the pressure in the line by 50% is correct, but you didn't actually reduce the pressure. You removed the molecules in the line set, which had a net effect of reducing the pressure. So that's what we do. And uh, start thinking about it that way. Start thinking about homogeneous dispersal and molecular activity at the pump, where your micron gauge is, way back in the system, and you'll start to have a better understanding of a vacuum and what happens when the, when the micron gauge bumps and things like that. Because that's what it's about, the flow of molecules. So I'll be back and we'll keep going.